So on the third day, as I said, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Okay, so Mary's definitely there. Jesus was also invited to the marriage and with his disciples, brings his disciples there, at least seven, maybe more that we don't know about. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. All right, so why we know that uh, this is going to be the first miracle that Jesus Jesus performs. It tells us that. It says this is the first of his miracles. So how does Mary know that he can do so? Why would Mary go to Jesus and say they have no wine? Unless they have no wine because Jesus brought a bunch of uninvited guests. <laughs> so this is the, the context here because you know from the Greek that the disciples weren't necessarily invited. They live over here in Bethsaida, all the way to the northeast of the Galilee. They have no reason to be at a wedding in Cana. Jesus does. He would have known them. Nazareth is in close proximity. So Jesus brings these uninvited guests. They have no wine. Uh, Mary goes to him and says, well, they have no wine. <laughs> and Jesus' response said to her, well, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Okay, so before we get to the miracle itself, let's make sense of that. That seems like a lot of indirect response. Okay, she says they have no wine. And Jesus says this really cryptic phrase. We'll get into what it means. He says, uh, oh, woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And then Mary doesn't even respond to that, but turns around and says the servants do whatever he tells you. All right, there's a lot of indirect response here. That means there's some subtext that we need to dig into a bit. OK, so if if uh, Mary goes to Jesus and tells him they have no wine, perhaps she's hoping that he'll do something to help, help you know, she's performing miracles. So it's not really going to be on her radar that he can do something miraculous yet. Um, but maybe he can help. Maybe you know it's possible she might be saying, you know, maybe he can go get some or something like that somewhere. I don't really think that's the case. I think it's true that they have no wine. <laughs> you brought these extra guests and these poor people have no wine, which would have been a real big shame on the bridegroom and, and, the, and the wife and the family holding a feast, not having the preparation for it, having run out of wine. And we'll get into the symbolism of wine in a second and what that's for. But Jesus's message there, his, his words to her, he says, uh, Oh woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. To, to our ears, to English speaking ears, it sounds like he's talking about sassing your mother. Look, woman, was that, what are you to me? You know, that, that is not what he's saying. Please don't just fall into the English trap and think that's what it means. OK, you have to do some context. You can't just read it uh, translation upon translation into the modern day Greek or English vernacular and think that's the, what it means with our own connotations. OK, so the word he calls her a woman, that is not a, uh, a, a slight or an insult like it would be in today's vernacular. You call, if you call any lady, especially your mother, a woman, you know, that means you need to slap in the face, right? That's what that means. But that's not what it meant. That Greek uh, Greek word for woman here, it's not a word that you would commonly call your mother, but it is a, a perfectly polite and acceptable term to call any other woman in the room, okay? It is perfectly accepted. You could be in the market and say, hey, woman, this, this, and that. You know, it was perfectly acceptable. But it's not a common word that one would call their mother. So there is something different going on there. And then when he says, uh, he says, oh, woman, what have you to do with me? All right, a better translation is even in the footnotes of my Bible, you can probably find it in yours, is that what, instead of what have you to do with me, it is what is that to you or me? What is that to you or me? Meaning she says they have no wine. What's that got, what does that have to do with you or me, right? What does that have to do here? So on the one hand, Jesus can be saying, it's my fault that they don't have wine. <laughs> you know, I brought my disciples. I was like, you know, uh, but on the other hand, Jesus is, is doing something key here because we know from the New Testament, Paul tells us that Jesus is the new Adam, right? Uh, th that's a common phrase for Jesus. The first man through the first man came sin through the second Adam came salvation. And that in the Garden of Eden, that story was God's most big man on blessing humanity and his covenant, the way he wanted to have a relationship with humanity. So he creates Adam and he gives him Adam Eve and they have this relationship and their covenantal relationship is marriage. It's marriage between Adam and Eve. And because Adam sinned, because Adam and Eve sinned, sin entered the world. And as Paul tells us, though sin entered the world through the first man, salvation enters through the second. So think about Jesus as the second Adam from a from a literary perspective, from just a, a symbol a symbolism perspective, it is amazing how Jesus goes through endlessly, redeems each and every step of the fall of nature. He redeems it. So, for example, the uh, man was cursed to to live by the sweat of his brow. 
Well, Jesus takes on that sweat of his brow to the point of sweating great droplets of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane later. We'll see, um, you know, really laboring in prayer where man has had to labor, you know, in, in manual labor. So Jesus is redeeming. He's taking on all of these curses onto himself and redeeming these things. Mankind was ousted from the Garden of Eden because he ate from the tree of the fruit of God, knowledge of good and evil. So he knew evil, but but decided to, to uh, you know, could, decided to do evil, knew the difference. Well, as we've seen John already, he, uh, Jesus's covenant here is calling people to repent, repent from the disobedience, repent from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the reason Adam and Eve were ousted, if you go back to the Genesis story, is that they had to be uh, banished from the garden of good and evil because they had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm sorry, they had to be banished from the garden of Eden because they'd eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in case they were to then turn around and eat from the fruit of the tree of life, that would have been very bad for them because that meant eternal life. That meant that would have solidified them in their state of sin. So God banishes them from the Garden of Eden, lest they also eat from the fruit of the tree of life and bring more harm upon themselves. Well, Jesus redeems all of these. Uh, you know, we can go through a lot more. It could be a whole session on itself, but he redeems all these elements of the curse to the point where he himself hangs on a tree. And the cross is the tree of life, because what is the fruit of the tree of life? What is the fruit of the tree of life that we are now able to partake of? And that doesn't solidify us in our sin, but rather transforms us. It's the body of Christ, right? It's the Eucharist. It's the body and blood of Christ, which becomes the fruit of the tree of life that we now are able to partake of. And this is all solid theology. I mean, this isn't just, uh, you know, something new here. You can go through the, the church fathers and everything like that. And there's that aspect there, but why am I bringing all this up? Well, I'm bringing all this up because if, if Jesus is the new Adam and he's been taking so much care throughout his life to redeem every little part of the fall, where's the new Eve? We need a new Eve. And as I'm going to point out here, Mary is the new Eve. Now, that you can believe this. Everything I'm saying here makes perfect literary and biblical sense. And you can 100% believe it, even if you're a Protestant and you don't believe the additional things that Catholics believe about Mary. I'll do this as we go through. You can believe this. Mary is uh, Mary is the new Eve in, in this context. Now, the first Adam and Eve were a wedding. They were a marriage, right? The next Adam and Eve, the new Adam and Eve, are, mo are mother and son. So we'll see that there's, but there is going to be a wife involved here. We'll see. Okay, so just, just go with this for a second. The beginning of Jesus's ministry. This is what John is going to call here in a second. Um, the first of his signs in verse uh, 11, after we get through the, the miracle, John will say, this is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So this is the first of Jesus manifesting his glory. This is the first of Jesus doing the work of the new covenant that he's bringing about. And he does it at a wedding. That's, 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 that's specific. That's, that's a um, impact. That's profound here. That he does. He chooses a wedding. He chooses this, the covenant of, chooses the event that solidifies what the first covenant was, marriage, to begin his ministry to bring upon his own covenant, which will be, be church and the Eucharist and all of that. So he chooses a wedding. That's significant. And then it's Mary who comes and says to him, they have no wine. And he says, he says that the, uh, my hour has not yet come. That could actually mean two different things as well. He could be say, talking about the hour, meaning his crucifixion. That, you know, that's a theme throughout the book of John when he talks about his hour or the hour is not yet come or the hour of the son of man is coming. He's talking about the time he'll be crucified, you know, the final hour. But the, in the Greek, you could also read it as a question. It's a little ambiguous as to which one it is. Or he could be saying, has not my hour already come? Meaning, of course, I'll help my hour here. My, my ministry, my ministry is already here. I'm here. I'm, this is what I'm here to do. Either way, he's he's drawing attention to the fact that he has an ultimate purpose. He has an ultimate covenant to fulfill here, and he has an ultimate obedience to God. And Mary is the one that comes to him in the text and says, they have no wine, insinuating for him to do it. So when the first Eve in the Garden of, of uh, Eden, when the first Eve told Adam, here, disobey God, don't do that which God created you for, eat this fruit. You know, so if through the first man, sin entered the world, and through the new man, salvation entered the world, Christ. Well, through the first Eve, disobedience and temptation entered the world. And through the second Eve, an encouragement of obedience entered the world. So it's it's clear, it's very significant that Mary says to Jesus, do the thing which God's created you for. They have 
no wine, prompt your head and manifest his glory, as John puts it there. Then we have him, um, then Mary turns around to the servants and, and, and says, uh, do whatever he tells you to. Not only does Mary tell the new Adam, encourage the new Adam to be obedient, as opposed to the old Eve. I'm sorry. Not only does the new Eve, Mary, encourage the new Adam to be obedient, as opposed to the old Eve, who encouraged him to sin. But the new Eve also turns to us, the servants, right? She's talking to the servants at the wedding, but that's us in this covenant, too. We're the servants of God. We're not only the servants of God, we're also the bride of Christ. That's how the Bible characterizes the church throughout all of the New Testament, even into Revelation. That's the imagery. The church is the bride of Christ. She tells not only the new Adam to obey God, but she turns and tells us, do whatever Christ tells you to do. It encourages us as part of that covenant, brings us into that new covenant and that redemption of the covenant, the new Eve, who is basically us as well. We are the new Eve and Mary as a created being, as a human being, one who was redeemed by Christ, just like we are. She she takes on that element of the, of the uh, covenant as well. So even though the new Adam and new Eve are, are man and mother, in a sense, it's also man and wife being cried Christ and the bride of Christ. So it's key what's happening here, telling the new Eve, Eve telling uh, Adam and us and well obey God don't disobey rather than the old Eve saying that and there's an aspect here uh, you know the the um, marriage is not only the the church was the church wasn't uh, called the bride of Christ that wasn't something new to um, to uh, got it marked here to the New Testament this is in the Old Testament as well uh, Hosea talks about it uses that imagery Isaiah himself in Isaiah 50, 54 5 says for your husband is your maker he's talking to Israel the Lord of hosts is his name, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And then in uh, chapter 62, verse 5, it says, As a young man marries a virgin, so your builder shall marry you. Talking to Israel, talking about that. So uh, the imagery of wedding was, was even used in Old Testament Messianic prophecy. So it's nothing new in the Old Testament. 